and welcome to um, the first of our lectures, recorded lectures, uh, for our remote learning. I hope you are having a great day. Um, we are going to talk about absolutism today. We're going to talk about the pursuit of power within Europe. Um, I believe this is chapter 14 in your book. Um, I know it used to be chapter 14 in the book, um, and I do not have my textbook in front of me right now. Um, but this is going to be the chapter after the age of exploration. Uh, I'm going to go on and begin. Please let me know if you have any questions um, when we conduct our Skype time on Thursday. I'm looking forward to seeing you then. Um, I would highly recommend, matter of fact, it's not just a recommendation, it is a requirement that you take notes on uh, your lectures. Um, you need to choose either the BJU lectures or these lecture tapes uh, to take notes on. Um, and then when you watch the other presentations, you can add notes in wherever you need to. But that will be a quiz grade, as we discussed in class um, several weeks ago. So make sure you are taking notes on at least one of the, le the lectures and then adding things in as you watch other presentations. All right, so let's begin. Um, first of all, we need to define the two types of power, or we need to identify the two types of power uh, that were prominent in Europe um, during the age of exploration um, and really on up through uh, Queen Victoria's reign um, in the 1800s. Um, power, the kings can have two types of power. They can have absolute power, which means they are the final authority. Um, no one can um, appeal their case above the king. Um, and then they can have restrained power, which means that somehow, some way, the king's power is limited. We're going to talk um, about how the kings received this power in Europe, um, and then we're going to look at France and at England as examples. Uh, France is going to be the example of absolute power. England will be the example of restrained power. Um, and during the, during the Middle Ages, royal power was limited. It was limited because competition for authority bet, uh, between the Pope and the kings existed. Um, so the king was always competing with the Pope for power over the people, influence in their lives. Um, and it was also limited because of competition for power between the feudal lords and the kings. So the kings were having to, they had two, two areas in which uh, they were having to try and, and compete for power with the Pope and then with the feudal lords. Um, with the decline of the papacy's power and the ending or passing of feudalism, royal power began to increase. The, the two groups that were pulling power away from the kings uh, were, were disintegrating, were, were losing popularity, um, and were going away, so uh, that left all the power for the king. During the 17th and 18th centuries, rulers worked to make political power absolute. Absolute power means it was unlimited, it was unrestrained. Um, and they did this in several ways. One was by increasing control over the nation's finances, religion, and nobility. Um, they made sure that they had more and more control over uh, taxing and how the money was spent and um, over what religion the nation was and, and then over the nobles as well. Um, we're going to see in France that uh, one of the King Louis did this by mandating that his nobles had to be at court for uh, the better part of the year. And when you were at court, you had to wear certain clothing and uh, certain types of clothing, which were very expensive. So he was able to limit the wealth of the nobles by mandating that they be at court where they had to have more expensive clothing and, and that kind of thing. Um, they also uh, tried to increase in authority by increasing the size of the government bureaucracy. Um, he would, uh, they would increase um, how many people were doing the job of the government, um, how many people were dependent upon the king for their job. If they're dependent upon the king for their job, then they're more likely to do what the king wants them to do. 
Uh, another way was by increasing the size of the standing army or navy, which would be under the king's control. So he would have a military force to back up his power. Fourthly, they would increase the size of territory, and they would use war to do this if necessary. So the more territory that they ruled, uh, the more power that they had. And so um, they would, uh, oftentimes they would start wars to be able to gain more territory and gain more power. The argument by these kings was that they had a divine right to rule. They said that God had established rulers. The Bible says that God establishes the governmental authority over us. Um, it says that no one rules except that God put them in that position. We don't always like that, but that is what scripture says. And so the king said, well, if God put me in, if, if God puts the leaders in power, if God appoints who the kings or the leaders of the nations are going to be, then he's given me the divine right. I have the right from God to be the leader, and so I should be the ultimate authority. Said so that kings were not uh, were not bound by man-made laws because God had put them in authority, and God's laws were higher than man's laws. Um, and they said they were only responsible to God for their actions. Um, so in many cases, they used scripture and they twisted it and contorted it to their own um, own benefit. Scripture does say that God gives us. Uh, authorities, government authorities over top of us, and that we are to submit to them unless they violate God's law. Um, but many times these kings were, were twisting and contorting that to give them more power than they probably should have had. Absolute rule accept, were, was accepted by most Europeans. Most Europeans accepted the absolute rule, the divine right of the king uh, to be the ultimate authority. They believed that strong leaders were the best way to ensure security. So they saw it as if I, if my leader, if my leader is an absolute monarch, if my king has ultimate authority, then we are more secure, and and I am uh, I'm comfortable being more secure. So so I'm willing to give him that authority so so that I have my security. So let's talk about absolutism in France. What did it look like? The best way to understand it is to see what it looked like. So France was the leading absolutionist nation in the 17th century. Um, Cardinals Richelieu and Marzarin secured mu uh, much of the king's power. Um, the, the king himself did not have to work very hard to get this absolute power. He had people within his court that did that for him. Um, their idea was they were friends of the king. The more power that the king had, the more power they would have. So they worked very hard to get uh, more and more power for the king. And the two that did this the most were Richelieu and Mazarin. Um, they increased their power by increasing the power of the kings and the power of France within Europe. Um, so again, they weren't just doing this out of the kindness of their heart or because they thought they had a really good king. They were doing it because by increasing his power, they were benefiting themselves. King Louis XIV was the ultimate beneficiary. He was the leading absolutionist ruler in Europe. So how did this come about? Well, Bourbon King Henry IV laid the foundation. He reduced the privileges of the nobility and increased government control of the economy. Uh, but he was assassinated by a Catholic extremist in 1610. So that was that was about as far as it went with him. So then King Louis XIII became king at nine years old. His mother was Marie de' Medici of the Italian de Medici's, and she ruled um, in his place until he came of age. 1624, Cardinal Richelieu became the chief minister. Um, and Richelieu strengthened the power of the king, King Louis XIII, by destroying the Huguenots, remember those with French Protestants, and he weakened the nobles. He destroyed the French Huguenots by taking children away from Huguenot families and giving them to good Catholic families to raise the children as Catholics. So if you were a French Protestant and it was known that you were a French Protestant, uh, the government would come in and take your children from you and give them to Catholic families so that the children would not be raised Protestant, they would be raised as Catholics. Um, he also spied on Huguenot churches uh, to see who was being critical of the government. 
uh, the way that he weakened the nobles was that he removed nobles from positions of authority within the government, destroyed castles of the nobles, and he imprisoned nobles who defied him um, and even executed or threatened them. The next thing that he did after he... Um, so he destroyed the Huguenots, he weakened the nobles. The third thing that Richelieu did was that he brought, brought France into the Thirty Years' War. This was the last great religious war fought in Europe, and, and he brought France into it. He brought France into it as a, as a way to gain power and, and property, um, not for religious re reasons. Um, how did the Thirty Years' War begin? Well, it began when Protestant Bohemian nobles revolted against the Catholic emperor. The Catholic emperor sent troops to crush the revolt, the uh, to, to crush the Protestant revolt, and they did this in a very ruthless manner. Um, this, of course, enraged the Protestants. War spreads. Uh, Protestantism almost collapses. Um, Gustavus Adolphus, who was king of Sweden, sent troops to Germany and recruited more soldiers, which won several victories, but was killed. But he was killed in, ba in battle. Richelieu decides to get France involved, actually on the Protestant side. Now, remember, he had persecuted French Protestants. He had taken their children away from them. Uh, he had spied on them. Uh, so he was not a fan of Protestantism. But he saw the Protestant side as his way uh, to more power. And so he gets France involved on the Protestant side because it will make France stronger while keeping Germany divided. Um, and so it was a political motivation, not a religious motivation. And the Protestants in Fran France win victory in 1648. Victory comes with the Peace of Westphalia, um, and it does two really important things. The Peace, Peace of Westphalia recognizes the independence of Protestant provinces in, Nor in the Netherlands and the Swiss, and Swiss. Um, and it recognizes over 300 independent German states where the prince will determine the religion of the province. France became the strongest nation on the European continent after this. Richelieu, however, dies in 1642 and King Louis XIII dies five months later. So King Louis XIV becomes king, but he's only five years old. Uh, Jules Marzarin becomes his chief minister. He's going to rule in Louis XIV's place until Louis XIV gets old enough to, to actually be king. He imposes, Marzarin imposes new taxes, um, and France goes into unrest. There's a series of riots, or fronds, and the last serious attempt to limit the king's power are these riots until the French Revolution, but they are, are not successful. So King Louis XIV becomes the epitome of absolutism. Marzarin finishes what Reg, Reg, uh, Richelieu had started. He garners all this power together, and when King Louis XIV is old enough to take on uh, the role as king, um, he is going to be the, the direct beneficiary of the culmination of all this power. Marzarin dies in 1661, and Louis XIV does not replace him. He does not appoint a new chief minister. He says that there's one king, one law, one faith. That is Louis XIV's idea. One king, one law, one faith. He says, I am the state. In other words, he is France. France would not exist without the king, is what he's saying. So he certainly buys into this absolute power. Um, so what does the age of Louis XIV look like? Well, let's look at their financial and military policies first. He appoints, the king appoints Jean-Baptiste Colbert, as Minister of Finance, and immediately begins tightening the control of the economy um, by the government. Mercantilism is the economic system of the day. France buys into it hook, line, and sinker. They want complete control of the economy. Um, and so Jean-Baptiste Colbert is appointed by the king. 
and he works towards this goal. Um, also, King Louis XIV reorganized the French army to owe allegiance to the king, not to the lieutenants or to their um, superior officers. Uh, so he reorganizes the French army to owe allegiance to the king. He places lieutenant colonels over regiments, and the lieutenant colonels are responsible to the king, not to somebody right above them. Soldiers were made to wear uniforms. They were well-trained, well-paid, and they were loyal to the king. Uh, they were, actually became the finest soldiers in Europe. Next, King Louis XIV revokes the Edict of Nantes. They remember, the Edict of Nantes had given the French Huguenots uh, some protections, some, um, some um, freedoms. But in 1685, the Edict of Nantes is revoked. Huguenots lose freedom to worship. Protestant education is forbade. Huguenot churches are demolished. And some Huguenots are made slaves on French ships. Um, 250,000 to 500,000 Huguenots actually leave France um, because of this. They, they leave France to um, flee this persecution. Many of them come to the United States. Uh, of course, it's not known as the United States at this time, but many of them come to the New World. Uh, this has a devastating effect on the French nation. Um, that is a large number uh, of people to leave um, it's going to affect the economy. Um, and so uh, that, that's going to have a devastating effect on, on France, but King Louis XIV really didn't care. So what was life like at the Palace of Versailles? Well, first of all, Versailles had been a hunting cottage um, until Louis XIV got a hold of it, and he had it built into a great grand palace. It was the envy of all of Europe. The court that was held at um, the Palace of Versailles was the envy of all of Europe. Everybody sent, all the other nations sent their courtiers to the French court to learn proper court etiquette and, and mannerisms. Um, and and it, was, it was Louis XIV's court that they did this at. Um, Louis XIV was known as the Sun King. That's because that's the symbol he chose for himself. Um, he considered himself the center of European life, and he really was. I mean, that was the happening place to be, was at the Palace of Versailles with King Louis XIV. He loved luxury and the attention of people at court. He built a great palace called Versailles, and it was built to impress his subjects. Grandeur was what was important, not practicality or utility. Um, just...